Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today we conclude our Pride 2020 celebration with a terrific panel featuring three African American LGBTQ creators. To moderate the session, we have Atlanta's NPR, Rose Scott. Rose, take it away. Gil, you know, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. I am here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, not in LA like the rest of the round table enjoying probably, you know, some avocado toast. I don't know. <laughs> Perry, Perry water. Isn't that what y'all do out there? <laughs> I got vitamin water right now. Vitamin C. <laughs> well, here it is. I'm batting this COVID. <laughs> I, got, I got kombucha, so I'm keeping it in LA. <laughs> All right. I appreciate that. But, you know, it's interesting because I had a question already picked out for the first question, but something Gil said that just really struck me. He said, you all are LGBT, LGBTQI creators. And I think I want to start with that. And I'll start with Trevon. What does that mean to be an LGBTQ creator? What does that mean? I mean, for me, it means that everything I do, I'm creating with the full, complete version of who I am and my identity. And so I bring that with me into every writer's room, into every set I direct on, into everything I write. It's it's infused into who I am, even when it's not about identity. It's it's still stamped with the fact that it was created by me as mm -hmm. a queer person. And so I think part of my journey and part of my goal is to get us to a place where it's a normal thing to to just you know, there's so that there's so many of us and, and there's so much of our work that we don't necessarily have to point it out, you know? Anthony, what about you? Uh, piggybacking off what Javon said, I think for me, it's important to not only show representation in the material that ends up on screen, but it's also seeing it behind the camera, you know, off screen. And so that we, you know, we're constantly looking for opportunity to you know, bring voice to our culture and our community. And I think we have to start with, with you know, finding the seat at the table um, in these, you know, different ranks from executives on down through the creatives. And I think as a creative, I'm constantly looking for the dimensions that either haven't been talked on or touched, touched on or talked about yet. Um, as well as finding, you know, what I feel is missing about myself on screen. Uh, Shari, what about you? Well, my, my practice uh, has mainly been curation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, throughout my entire career, maybe until recently, um, I've been kind of the outside voice. Uh, and so what it means to me is that I, I, I practice from the power of looking at look at looking at things from the outside mm -hmm. there's an incredible power of, of an outside perspective because it's the outsider that can see the whole picture mm -hmm. and so um and it's also where uh i have free license to create things that that and and work outside of the box uh and and create worlds i'm kind of like a world builder in a certain way um throughout my career I've created new sections for festivals you know new frontier something that i uh, created at, at at sundance uh, you know, creating new language for, uh, through which to even consider films. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's uh, I do a lot of that kind of thing um, and to create space, to create new spaces outside of the box. And actually, you know, life outside of the box is, tends to be a little more interesting. Um, well, no, yeah. that's interesting because Anthony talked about having a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And when I, whenever I hear an expression like that, I often want to follow up with, does that mean that you weren't, you had to get some type of special invite? So in terms of, has there been this exclusion? Okay, maybe we can all say, yeah, of course there's been this exclusion of LGBTQ content over the years, but often we hear, oh, but we've come such a long way. So what does that really mean? Is it just enough to be at the table, as Anthony said? And then how do you turn that into an outcome, which is content? 
that the masses can enjoy. And, and, and Sheree, I'll stick with you and let you tackle that one. All right. Um, well, I feel like, you know, uh, when I was uh, invited to come to be a programmer at Sundance, I felt like, okay, well, I'm at the table now. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I did a lot there at the table, brought a lot of filmmakers into the festival. Uh, but it, it, it became clear to me at, the longer I was there that I had to actually build another table <laughs> to saddle up to the table to, to create more seats, you know, uh, for. So that's, um, you know, I think these are, you know, strategies that come in historical uh, succession. And um, it's important to get into these rooms, to get into these writers' rooms. Uh, but it's also important to, you know, bring up a, uh, a, the, a, a class, a younger class, a class that's been shut out of creatives uh, to, to find their voice outside too, you know, like I, there's a, because what's important is to, to represent the full spectrum of our voices, of our lives, you know, to, so that we can vibrate our humanity, you know, in society. And 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 live the gift of 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 our lives in in our in our society, and so to to do that, that's not just one table. You know that table, the one table is the problem. You know, like yeah. I, we need lots of tables. <laughs> so that's that's <laughs> that's been my my approach. You just said something I think should be on a T-shirt. Vibrate our humanity. Is it okay if I go ahead and copyright that? Hey, hey. <laughs> spread the love. Spread the love. You're talking about content, and I'm a person stealing yours. <laughs> <laughs> Trayvon, let me bring this conversation. What does it mean to get to that table? You know, I mean, you're a writer. How did you get to that table? It's, I mean, she kind of took the words out of my mouth. You kind of, I think you, at some point, it's about building your own table. It's about, because when you get a seat at the table, it's still someone else's table. And I didn't set this table. I didn't pick these chairs. I mean, this, this, this is not the table that I would necessarily prefer, but it is the table. And I mean, for me, it, it was a path that was unconventional, but it was the path that's usually the only way in for us, which is usually self-taught, self-networked, self-everything. You kind of have to do it all yourself because usually where if you come from where I come from, like Compton and inner cities like that with not a lot of resources, there's no arts programs, there's no writing programs, there's no one giving you access to the best and brightest and people from Hollywood aren't speaking at your school and mm -hmm. things of that nature. So for me, it was when I decided I wanted to turn my writing into something creative, I had to dig around and find scripts on my own. I had to learn how to write in uh, uh, scripts on my own and just do all the work of studying TV shows that I liked and shows that I would want to write for until a job opportunity came along. And I just, I got really lucky that um, someone at The Daily Show who I just so happened to do a stand-up show with, like put me on their list of potential writers when they had an opening and getting that job is literally just what changed my life, what transformed my entire ability to have a career. And it shouldn't, for us, it has to be a series of events and luck, but we, we wanna get to, and I wanna get us to a place where young black kids and, and writers don't have to depend on threading all these needles to have a, a basic career, you know? I think we need to get to a point where they have the resources to especially queer kids have the resources to tell their stories and learn how to do it in a way that is an industry standard and makes people listen to them. Uh, Anthony, what about you? How'd you get to the table? Um, you know, I was given my shot through my mother. You know, I, I basically, I grew up in the business. Um, she's been in the industry before I was born. So I basically was kind of birthed into it. It wasn't something that I, you know, took to initially my childhood, growing up around mortality, you know, I wanted to pursue a career and a dream of, of a doctor because I wanted to save the world um, and to help heal um, us and do what I could in that, by that 
through that contribution. And so that was my dream. You know, I think as a child, I did have opportunity. I was an extra, I was an actor, I was a PA, you know, early on starting PAing when I was 12. Um, so I, I was blessed by way of her. And so, you know, my senior year in high school, I had a major change of heart of not wanting to go to college anymore. And, um, and so I kind of fell back onto what I had already knew. And it was that moment that really was my defining moment, which is where I realized that I could heal and bring healing through the art of storytelling. And so it was something that I just kind of started to, to read the signs and to listen to, you know, uh, things that were said around me that I was picking up along the way in certain conversations. So that was my seat. And, and I quickly realized that I had to then, um, you know, create an avenue for myself because it wasn't only, you know, because she got me in the door, I had to then continue to walk and, and, and build my own you know, because nothing was given. It wasn't like it was easy just because I had the introduction through her. It was still hard. You know, it's still hard <laughs> now. Um, and so we're constantly looking to do it. And, you know, in the words of Nina Simone, you know, I have long been wanting to reflect the world that, that, that you know, I live in. And so I find the duty that, you know, it's our responsibility to, you know, not only, I think, find opportunity for our stories. I love to even, you know, defy what is always put against us and we're held back by that we can't do other things. We're put in a box all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly, and I've always been fighting, you know, breaking those glass ceilings and, and helping to show that we can, that it is possible and using myself as an example. Um, and so, uh, I think for not only just our stories, it's, st you know, there are many stories within us, you know, we can be artists and storytellers and tell, you know, many different stories. And so I, you know, I, it is about creating, you know, our own tables um, and, and building our houses and, and so on and so on and like helping to really cultivate and create and raise up and you know, create, continue to, to empower and create other opportunities. You know, um, late last year, there was a NBC piece that explored, and it, the title was, you know, what's keeping Hollywood from meaningful LGBTQ representation. And it, it talked about how TV and streaming platforms were what they considered doing well, but big screen movies, you know, not so much. Um, so there's two questions here. And the first is, what are your thoughts on that? And then also, why do we still see the movie theater, the big screen, as the ultimate in when you reach this plateau of, of proper LGBTQ representation? So let's go back to the first question. I mean, what are your thoughts on that, that TV and streaming platforms, okay, yeah, they're getting it in terms of LGBTQ representation, and then the movies are still a little slow. And I'll stay with you, Anthony. Um, films are hard to make, especially now, just the economy. It's just really challenging. I think we are seeing the surgence of, of opportunity on TV platform and, and in streaming. Um, and it just creates, it, it's, it creates more opportunity. There are more options to have, I think, for us to be able to, you know, get out and, and find opportunity. So I've, I've, pretty much grown up in the TV space. So I love it. I love challenging it. I love helping innovate it and, and, and help it evolve. Um, I think the, you know, getting on the, the big screen as that is somewhat of a, you know, a gold um, creatively. It's, it's, it's just where you can really be able to bring breath to whatever stories we tell. It's just a bigger canvas. Um, it's just the, 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 you know, the detail that goes into that is a little more um, necessary and, and, and demands more, you know, I think fine tuning because of the, you know, the format. And so, it's always the opportunity. It's like an actor wanting to get on the stage. You're able to really breathe and stretch. And, you know, it's just a different, it's such a different dynamic. 
Trevon, what about you? This notion that uh, you know TV and streaming platforms are are doing it well when it comes to LGBTQ representation, but not so much on the big screens. What do you think? I think I think they're doing. I think they're doing better. Uh, but I think like like Anthony kind of nailed it. I think you TV's like a buffet in the sense that like there's so many opportunities to create shows and to give space to LGBTQ characters. Whereas like he's saying, films not only take are hard to make, take a long time to make, and the stories are so deliberate that it's easy for me to to go pitch a TV show that's gonna be 10 or 12 episodes a season. And I say to the network, like, oh, I have, I also have these queer characters who are part of this, this story, this tapestry, versus walking into Warner Brothers or somewhere and saying, hey, I wanna tell this two hour, very specific story about these very specific queer characters. And knowing that people go to the movies very deliberately to see something very specific, they're looking at it from a dollar standpoint, I'm looking at it from a story standpoint, mm -hmm. and they still don't see, I don't think they still see the dollars there yet for us. I think you look at like even a movie like Moonlight where it's uh, one of the, the best movies in the past 20 years and it wins an Oscar for best picture, but money wise, it doesn't like rake in a bunch of money. You right. have to like then gamble and hope that you land in that critical acclaim spot and because they don't, they don't see the big box office value in telling queer stories on a massive scale like that. And you tend to not see those characters in the type of James Bond, big, expensive movies like Marvel movies where they know they're gonna guarantee, they're gonna be guaranteed to make a certain dollar amount no matter what type of character is there. And I think for us, we as queer storytellers are still in that stage of wanting to tell smaller specific stories about ourselves about our our experiences and it's it's just up to us to get them to see the value in it sure what about you we make well, that yeah i i think that uh you know the big screen you know cinema proper is a much older industry it's a mature industry and um and the values are coming from an older place Streaming platforms and the technology tends to do this, tends to hack at the inefficiencies of, of, of you know, systems that were there before, institutions that were there before. So um, and the way that's played out in my experience at Sundance is before, when Netflix and Amazon and, you know, the streaming platforms started to hit the scene, all of a sudden, a lot of the films by people of color, made by people of color, were getting bought a, a lot faster. And, um, and then we start to see it on the landscape. And it's because, you know, those that uh, it's, a, it's a younger industry, you know, it's, it's, it's younger and it's more vital and it's coming up in another kind of world, different values. Not to say that there's still work to be done there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also seeing it, you know, with New Frontier, you know, I, when I started New Frontier in the, the, the XR space, you know, VR, AR. Uh, if you come to New Frontier at Sundance, you'll probably see more people of color at that section than any other section of the festival. And that's been going on now for like 15 years. So I think that, um, you know, uh, as, 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 as much as I, I completely believe what Trayvon and Anthony has been saying <clears throat> is true, there's also the larger perspective of, of uh, the progression of platform and how the media landscape is shifting and changing and affording new opportunities. I mean, look at us right now. We're inside of a bad indie movie called Zoom uh, <laughs> that is replacing the telephone, you know? And, and so and, and in, a, in a time where you know, we have unprecedented success uh, uh, metrics around, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and, and protests and, and people really not oriented in their lives because of COVID uh, for various reasons. It's an incredible opportunity, I think, uh, uh, for, for another sort of sea change um, that, that on, on the top of this technology, because, you know, uh, cinema, television, streaming platforms, mobile, uh, mm -hmm. or let's say um, uh, social media networks like TikTok and, and, and Instagram, uh, these are all now points of access to share stories. Mm -hmm. And up to now, they've been thought about as separate things. But this, in this time of, of great change, uh, we're really starting to see, at least I am, starting to see the landscape in a very different way 
opportunities that look at all of these um, screens as, as a network, an integrated network that can be engaged to, to build a new table. So I, I, I think that um, it really has to do with um, an entrenched industry that it has having a very hard time moving around. But they're gonna have a hard time now that you know, all these 16 and under uh, people on, in America are more brown than white. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because it sounds to me that, look, there isn't a lack of LGBTQ centered content or content creators. Because, you know, it used to be, you used to hear, they say it's about Black folks. Well, we don't have enough content. Well, it's not the case anymore. So is it really just an issue of distribution? Because we know, it sounds like from what y'all said, the quality is there. The content is there. Mm -hmm. Is it, uh, and if it's, is this a, a situation of it's about distribution, getting this content to the masses? And if so, is the streaming platform the way to go? Or YouTube, which is free. Shari, I'll let you take that first. There, there is a, there's a really great conference that I went to last year at Harvard, organized by Sarah Lewis, um, called Vision and Justice. I love Sarah Lewis. Yeah, she's amazing, right? Um, and and the, the, the center of what that conference was about was that uh, we're not going to have racial equity until the way, the, the culture of how we see changes, right? And so I, I deal with that in, in my job and in the field of uh, you know, people uh, looking at films by people of color and judging them as bad because they can't see the humanity of the central character. That happens a lot. In fact, when I was at Outfest, I remember a big old, <laughs> big old drag down fight. Um, I was a director at Outfest and I had two films. Uh, one was called Punks by Patrick Ian Polk. Yeah. And the other one was called The Broken Hearts Club, right? Now, if you look at those two films, they're the same exact film. On paper, they look, they look exactly the same, like an ensemble uh, cast of people trying to figure out romance. And, uh, and we were trying to decide which one's going to be the opening night and which one was going to be this, you know, basically it was an opening night uh, conversation. And we talked about The Broken Hearts Club in the room, which is mainly why it was like, oh yeah, it's such a great movie. It's so sweet, it could really work. And uh, when we talked about Punks, which was actually like a very beautiful film, like the, the, the production quality was just higher. Yeah, it's not a good film, bad film. I was astonished by like how easy it was to say, you know, and this was earlier on in my career and I saw that over and over again. So, uh, you know, what I've, what I've, what I've, proven over the course of many years at, at doing this is breaking through some of these films and then letting the audience decide. Mm -hmm. And so many of these films have become hits, you know, so many of them, Lee Daniels' films, Dear White People, Cheryl Denier's films. I mean, the, the list goes on, you know, and, and so, uh, so there is that one part of it of, of trying to figure out by hook or by crook, you know, I've definitely used in my, in my career the, the uh, strategy of, it's your idea, it's not my idea. <laughs> it's your idea, so put it on the stage right. and let it perform. And then it's, you know, it's like, I, I don't have that much of an ego to need to, to claim all of those, those victories, well, but um, you know, that's. Well, and I wanna get Trevon and Anthony's take on this, but Cherie also sounds like you, having someone like you, having more people like you is key as well, in terms of, you mentioned gatekeepers and people who can help spotlight and help bring this content and i guess that's another conversation for another day about how do we even get more people like you in those key decision making positions you know well that's uh you know that's why i also think about that new table you know just build building those and reimagining uh, <clears throat> a, a a world where we're not as reliant on the tables but you know that's it we are, I think we are still at a place where you're right. More people need to be in places of power to make that link from, from just, you know, not having access, basic access to learning stuff, to practicing your art, to, and, and then showing the, the work so that you can engage with an audience. We need, that's the first step. And Trayvon, Anthony, I want to get you on, get you all in on this. Trayvon, how do we make sure we get this beautiful content that's out there from these beautiful content creators? How do we make sure 
you can get that to the proper platforms, the proper area, the proper showing. How do we do that? I think uh, she nailed it in the sense of like, we need more people like us who are decision makers in terms of what content is being seen and being bought because I'm like, I currently have a show I'm developing at CBS All Access and it is it about a public radio host? Because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, it, it does revolve around a, a queer central character, uh, one of the three main characters. And it has been one of the best development experiences I've ever had solely because we have a Black executive who is our, basically our head developer. And he gets it and understands it in a way that I've never really experienced with a project. And it, it just, you feel the difference when you don't have to communicate your identity and try to sell the product. Where I can walk into the room as a black person, and I don't have to sell blackness. I don't have to get you to understand why this story is valuable coming from me he already understands it and he's been our biggest champion and it's it proved to me from every development experience i've had that it makes a huge difference when you're when people who understand you people who look like you are in the room and we still don't have enough people who look like us who have the power to green light projects i think there's only maybe three people of color in the entire TV and film landscape who have the ability to say, yes, that gets to be seen by the masses and someone can't stop them or tell them no. And I think that is a huge barrier to entry for us as people of color, let alone queer people of color telling stories that are even more unique and than just stories about our racial identity. Wow. Um, and I wish every content creator could have a great story about what you just said. I mean, that would be great. Um, Anthony, how do yeah, we- Yeah, I, I echo what both Sherry and Javon said. It's back to that seat at the table, building our, you know, creating our own tables, you know, continuing to get the, the decision makers in places that we, where we don't have to start from square one or zero in just even trying to get our stories heard. You know, like Trevon said, having someone as a champion or an ally in there where you can go in and they celebrate and support what you say, what you're, you know, bringing to them is crucial um, and it's so beneficial, you know, um, and it's, you know, it's our job to continue to to help find these stories. I am <laughs> developing something right now in the trans space. I'm, 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 I'm have long been wanting to tackle you know, toxic masculinity um, and, 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 and how that even connects to, you know, the queer uh, cult community um, and, and many other ideas that constantly are looking to, to try, try to just look at the, the landscape and see what we have done. And, and for me, I, you know, there are sometimes that I, I come into stories that I get so excited about and passionate about um that might have already been told and not that i you know give up because it's been told because it might add another perspective or support what has been told so it's a matter of just continuing to put them out you know a lot of times people do come to that that point in their selves where it's like oh it's been done before but you know what every voice is necessary and and we need to hear each other's voices and so it's a matter of just continuing to push through, you know, and persevere and not give up and, and you know, find every opportunity and, 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 and moment we can. Anthony, we're gonna have to circle around after this because I want to know more about that film. <laughs> uh, I, I have several, I only gave you a few, but I, I, I'm, I will be coming to you. <laughs> I got some story ideas, um, but you know, I want to segue to that because Anthony, um, based on what you just said, the story themes, the storylines. You know, I, I heard somebody say, well, they're all, and I've had this conversation. They said, well, they're always the same. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, it's always about, you know, 
it's a it's a horrific situation and the character has to find him or self or they themselves and you know they grew up in a horrific situation and and this is for my lgbtq person who told me i'm just tired of seeing that almost like people saying i'm tired of the slavery narrative and so i don't i guess it's up to each individual but when we talk about the lgbtq narrative i mean you as you just said anthony that can be told through different lenses but you know is there and I don't want to say is there any validity to it, but do you understand when people say, well, I'm just tired of seeing the same story about with an LGBTQ the, you know, thing. Is that a, what do you think about that? I, I, I hear it all the time. I mean, you know, I'm dealing with it currently now with developing a, uh, an adaptation of a, 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 a New York Times bestseller book called Washington Black. We're developing it over at Hulu and, you know, the the conversation had come up along the way in the process where, you know, and, and having done Underground, which, you know, is one of my top experiences in, in storytelling, um, you know, I we heard it all the time, you know, oh, we don't need to see ourselves in slavery again, you know, but it's a, it's the, it's a matter of one, we have to get uncomfortable to heal and move forward. Um, and, and behind that, it's about seeing ourselves like we've not seen it before. You know, it's about bringing agency to our story and to us um, and, and finding hope within those stories and, 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 and finding it in perspectives in ways that doesn't, you know, fall into the, the, you know, the traps of the white savior story or where we just become victim and oppressed all the time, you know, obviously that's history and we can't rewrite it, but it's about using it to the, to the benefit of us to move forward, you know, find the mechanism that we can to, to heal and advance our, our culture. Trevon, what about you? Um, this notion of the narratives of all the same, they're all the same. I, I think, I mean, I, I hear that too with, with like slavery stories and, some form of, of queer storytelling, but I, I think there's a privilege of being able to tell stories that aren't centered in your pain that people have that we haven't been given the opportunity to grow past as, as storytellers when it comes to where we are in the landscape of, of storytelling and where white people are in the landscape of storytelling, where they, the, the stories that we have to tell when you finally get led in the room is your story. You wanna tell your story. And it is it's not our fault that our stories tend to be rooted in the pain we experience, usually at the hands of white people. Mm -hmm. And so it, it makes perfect sense that queer storytellers, black storytellers naturally want to expose the world to the pain that it's caused you. And mm -hmm. I think it's not about shutting people out or shutting people up about telling their story that's, that's rooted in pain because I think it's reductive to say, oh, they're all the same because they're not all the same. Mm -hmm. My story about my pain as a queer person is gonna be different from Anthony's. It's gonna be different from anybody's. And the, the, what they're, I think what they're getting at is the cause of the pain, the root of the pain is the same, but the story is not. And I think once we let people get to a point where they can release that, that catharsis of having told their story, having expounded their pain through the story that they wanted to tell, then you get to the, the level where you feel like, okay, now I can tell another story that maybe not, that may not be grounded or centered in the actual trauma I experienced as an individual, but I can still use that trauma and that experience to tell other stories, to infuse other narratives. But a lot of us haven't been given the opportunity to grow to that stage. And isn't that the conversation we're having right now in this nation about people and being uncomfortable and having these conversations? Uh, Sheree, what about you in terms of this, the narrative or different narratives as it relates to the LGBTQ folks? Um, this, is, this is not an artist problem. This is a gatekeeper problem. Okay. It, uh, because, uh, and, and this is a problem about racism manufacturing more of itself. You know, because artists, they, they need to tell stories. They have to have the freedom of artistic expression, independent expression, to tell their stories. Uh, if they are true to that process, 
an audience will respond to it. If an artist feels like they're, they're boxed in, have to tell a certain kind of story, they, you know, part of that soul doesn't go into the story and you get some of, some of these stiffer stories that you see out there. But, um, you know, the, 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 the way that we are, the reason why audiences are burdened by too many of one kind of story is because it serves the story of racism and, and, and white supremacy. And, 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 and that's really the problem. Those stories, there's so many different stories that are being made. There's so many, I see so many of them. At little, different levels of production. Um, but it's, in my, pra in my practice, it's so much easier to, to, to talk about a film, you know, like Precious, right? As opposed to a film like Clemency. Right. Uh, because, because our whole culture makes a film like Precious very legible, even though it's so fresh and amazing. But of, of our culture has uh, built lots of barriers to the legitimacy of film like Clemency, which happened to be, you know, won the grand jury prize, first, you know, historic, first black woman to win a grand jury prize at Sundance. So that's, uh, that's, that's, you know, the full spectrum can be found within a specific genre and spectrum can be found within the multitude of experiences. And we need, we need as black people, all of that as an American society, we need all of that. And so this is not a problem of the artist. This is a problem of, of what, what kinds of narratives are being chosen to, to um, find distribution and find access that, that reinforce a certain kind of power structure. I'm a big science fiction fan. I love superhero movies, you know, and I want to talk about this whole Black Panther effect because after Black Fa Panther, everything was supposed to be great for all Black cast movies, right? <laughs> it didn't quite happen that way. Uh, Shari, I'll stay with you. But um, the, the great thing, though, about Black Panther is that we know it could work. But moving from that, you know, year, just a few years, a couple years removed from that, do you think we'll see another big film and it says it's all black cast that will do as much of the, that will bank in, that will bring in the money like Black Panther did? It, or was that just a one-off, you know? And I hate asking that question, but we made such a big deal about it. People like me in my industry having this round table conversation about, oh, the Black Panther effect is gonna open this up and this floodgates of new content of all black cast and, you know, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I can't really predict the future, you know, even though I'm, you know, asked to talk about the future all the time because of my role in technology. Um, but, but I, I will, I will say that I don't know if this is happening to you, but when I go onto streaming platforms in this moment, I'm seeing so many people of color, Black Lives Matter, Black films, There, you know, maybe it's my bubble, my, you know, but it's, but it's, it, there is a, there, there is definitely a uh, um, a shift in the, the accessibility of 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 these stories, and I and I think it's it, and it's not really going away just yet. It's building. These things happen definitely in incremental steps. This is just like one of these unique opening opportunities that came right after the Black Panther. You know, they, so I do I do I don't think that we're going to go backwards on this. I, I I think that there's a growing momentum. Uh, you know, especially with this new generation, what they're going to want to see to, um, you know, to, to affect a, a demand and, 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 to, and to kind of announce a legitimate, uh, uh, not a legitimate, but a legible audience for films like that. And it, and it occurs to me, too, that, um, you know, that the, the role of technology played in these protests that are happening around the world. Mm -hmm. If you think about uh, studios and how often, I'd be curious to know Anthony and Trayvon, how often they ask you about your social media accounts and mm -hmm. how, you know, getting, even scoring jobs, you know, ba is based on this technology that you're sitting on, you know? Like, so how can we flip that script? How can, how can influencers, come, influencers come together and, and, and leverage uh, these studios to, to make certain kinds of films uh, th that they would come up and support through their networks because it's clear that the, the studios are 
they're struggling and they, they need to bridge over to these um, new technology platforms that are really touching way more people than the studios are. Um, you know, how can that come together in a way that can advance our images? Well, um, let's, talk, let's talk about that, Trayvon. I'll, you know, how do you guys do that? You all are influencers. You know, I'm just a person behind a mic in public radio. How do you all do that, Javon? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the that's the trick and the challenge. It's like trying to amass uh, a fan base now that you walk into a studio or a network with already because that's what they're looking for. Like, it, 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 we definitely get asked about it, at least I have. Uh, it comes up fairly regularly. And I think when you look at... I think it's a new a new area to to mine in terms of coming together as influencers or people with with followings to to put your power together and and take on the studio in that way. I've never really seen anything done like that or heard anyone talk about it. So to me, for me, that's a that's a fresh idea and a fresh way to think about how to leverage our power and ability to get stories told and made. So mobilizing, uh, Anthony, what's your take on? I think that? it. I think it's happening. It's starting. We're starting to see that 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 integration because, um, as Sherry was saying, studios are hurting, and so they are trying to to find the solution or, or avenues to help them, you know, stay afloat or just to continue growing um you know my husband's an actor and i i've long heard him talk about <clears throat> when he gets breakdowns you know to do an audition mm -hmm. they ask you know it's written you know to put down how many followers you have <laughs> mm -hmm. you know so even in that perspective like it's happening i per personally don't really get asked that question i mean you know when we get into marketing of something you know they'll want to know all your social platforms but it's never from the perspective of uh you know who can you reach or you know how can we use you know you to you know bring some sense of security or or whatever to help you know i think um get the word out on on whatever we're doing but i do i have seen it start to come into play um I think there are a couple short form platforms now that I, I don't know the name of it, but I saw a show where, and because I love Blame It All Quay, I saw a, a, a billboard actually not far from where I live where it was a lot of influence on there, which were the influencers who were the talent for this particular show. Can't think of the name of it right now, but you know, it is, it's about being creative and thinking out of the box and being, you know, innovative and, and continuing to break ground and find all the uh, possibilities that we can to tell stories. I want to give an opportunity for you all to talk about what you're involved in, but before we get to that, and Anthony, I'll start with you, I want to talk about just this whole notion of 2020 that still, and we talked a little bit about distribution, but, and y'all educate me on this, that Black, we don't own any true distribution platform so we don't have to rely on all these other individuals and entities that we talked about. I mean T Tyler Perry has his own studio and all that and we tend to to you know use Tyler as an example and he's been a great example but still just distribution is the key and I know it's expensive. So Anthony in 2020 I mean are we still by 2025 going to be talking about distribution that people of color, black folks, we still don't have uh, any power in distribution. No, I hope it changes. I know that that's part of what I'm working on in the background, which is trying to continue to see the needs for all of our stories and, and, and um, you know, creatives. And so that is an area that I have my eye on, you know, with in terms of trying to figure out how I can help um, change that, that narrative. Um, but, you know, I... Yeah, I mean, it's just, I know it's it's been slow. And I think uh, there are a few out there, you know, from Revolt to, you know, um, who else? I mean, OWN. Um, there are several that are slowly, I think, building and growing. And it's about, you know, when we get that opportunity, are, are responsible in many areas 
find a way to, you know, usher others in. Javon, distribution in the future. How does it look? I mean, I, I'm hopeful that there is enough of us with the talent and the resources to, to find a way to create a new avenue for us as creators. I, I, when I think about people like Oprah and Tyler and even the like handful of black billionaires and these really, really wealthy athletes, I think there's enough of us to really get creative and come up with something new and interesting that is uh, fresh and risky and, and, and fun but also gives us the chance to finally say, we're going to do this and nobody in this business can finally say anything to us or tell us no or stop us. And we, we, it's the one thing that I think is what scares white Hollywood, which is why you have not seen very many women or people of color with the ability to dis determine what goes on television or determine what movies see a big screen. I think there's a reason why for all these years, for all these decades, it's continued to be white men. And I think they recognize in other arenas of life, when you start to relinquish that power, when you start to let, let us in, you don't, you don't get that back. And I think there's a certain element of that that they are not comfortable with, with releasing. And it's why we see our black executives and our executives of color hit that, v, that VP glass ceiling at every studio where they reach the, the second tier of the highest part of the, of the company they can reach before you become a person with green light power. And so I, I, I hope that, and I hear people throw this around all the time when you, you hear people go, oh, Diddy and so-and-so are putting money together to buy a team. And it's like, well, why buy a team? Why not create a studio? Yeah, for real. Create a studio and control content and like literally tell the stories that don't get told and then cre give people the opportunity to spend the next 50 or 100 years growing from that tree and creating more and more black and brown and, and women-led studios and places where they have the ability to tell the stories they want to tell and let the box office speak for, speak for itself. Yeah. Tree, distribution in the future, where are we going to be? Yeah, I, I think that um, we are trending upward okay. uh, because when you think about today, um, and I'm going to say seven years ago, 10 years ago, as opposed to five years ago, that's when you really start to see the, the shift. You are mm -hmm. seeing so many more people of color in on television, the stories that you can touch in like some of these like um, legacy forms like television and, and film. To a certain extent, but mainly mainly television and cable. Um, and now, uh, you know, and 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 we're also seeing. I don't know if you all know this, but there is now a black lesbian festival director at Sundance. Her name is Tabitha Jackson. I know it. So that is a huge shift over. You know, yeah. as in 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 my institution, um, that you know in many ways struggle to intervene uh, in, into the studio system to like make it more capacious, uh, you know, independent films, mm -hmm. films that they thought was too risky. You put it on the stage of Sundance and it performs and then they're there to buy it up on the other end of it, you know. Um, but you know, as, in five years, the one thing that I do know is that those 16 year olds will be 20, yeah. 21, they'll be voting. There'll be a whole lot more. The, the landscape's gonna change. So that also gives me quite a bit of hope um, that we're going to see some repercussions from that. And that is not just a, a little bit of an increase. That is an exponential increase. <laughs> There's so many more 16 year olds than there are of our age on, on the planet, just generally. So, yeah. so that, that also makes me feel like maybe the future is uh, going to be a different than this because that, that generation also in terms of you know um people of color queer people they are much more fluid much more interested in 
uh, less encumbered by some of the old values and more interested in, in, in experiences that speak to uh, uh, life that is fresh and uh, of discovering new things, the, the multiplicity, the multifaceted uh, experiences and challenges that you that you that we face in, in general, you know. Um, so I I'm I, I, I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic. Well, let me stay with you for a second. Um, is there a LGBTQI narrative storyline that hasn't been told yet that you would like to see out there that <laughs> hasn't really hit? And I hate the word mainstream sometimes, but. I guess that's the best word for now. Fine. Go ahead. Jump on in there. And then uh, we'll come back to Sherry. Oh, no, I didn't know. I, didn't, I was just joking. Well, I was serious, but I was just joking. Um, no, but I mean, <laughs> mine. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's okay. the, the story first. I've been trying to tell for three or four years now, which is it was set up at HBO and now it's back with me. But um, I've not seen. Uh, an accurate depiction or any real depiction of myself in film or TV as a, a, a bi man of color, by black man. And so I created it and for a second and looked like HBO wanted to make it. And, and then it hit that ceiling where you get to the point where they don't understand what the thing is anymore. And you end up having to go your separate ways. But um, I'm still looking for a place to tell that story and it's still, as as a, as far as we've come with telling queer stories, and it's in it's even represented in the in the Glad report from 2019 on TV, we are still as bi people practically invisible, practically uh, not there, and are and when we are, we are used in a way that is completely unrepresentative of who we are. We are plot devices, we are uh, manipulators, and and on all these kind of things that is just historically using the same stereotypes and tropes. And I wanna see us get to a place where the fact that bi people make up 52% of the queer community, but are only out in, in to 28%, 20, only 20% of bi people are out to anyone mm -hmm. in, the, in terms of friends and family in relation to it being 77% for gay men and lesbians is, a, a, it speaks to the fact that there's a discomfort and a, uh, an improper narrative around who we are. And I think that shift changes when people start to see themselves represented in a way that's not a joke, that's not uh, yeah. taken lightly. And, and I'm, I'm just trying to push to change that narrative. Oh, I hear you on that. Anthony, what about you? I agree. Yeah, I agree. I, for so long, you know, have not seen, and I'm just trying to make sure it hadn't come out recently, but I've not seen like, you know, there's so many dimensions of who we are. Just, you know, like what Trevon said, like it's always the stereotypical versions that are, that are out there. And, you know, we all need to be represented. And so, you know, I'm glad that the small percent of, of, of our representation has been out there, but there's so much, so much more to um, be shared and, and experienced. So I, I, I just second what he said. Sherry, right. back to you. Well, um, we showed a documentary last year called Coded Bias, mm -hmm. and it focused on this black technologist at MIT called Joy Bolmwini. And she, uh, she made, uh, New York Times headlines uh, in her work around facial recognition uh, because she was at, she was working, uh, she's a technologist who's also an artist and creating this piece um, that was like a mirror using facial recognition realized that the technology wasn't reading her vo her face. And, uh, and by accident, a white colleague came in, totally read their face. It turns out that the technology itself was racist because wow. it was created by white technologists, you know, white men. Um, and so this documentary is about her, uh, her path at, you know, from the point of that recognition 
to going in front of Congress, urging, uh, basically putting up the red flag of these facial recognition technologies being used by the police. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now she's a creative technologist, so I want to I want to see the Steve Jobs, but it's the the community of black technologists. Mm-hmm. She is now part of a of a of a superhero group that actually is it exists. It's called the Algorithmic Justice League. Oh, okay. And I want to see the movie about them in five years and how they manage to, and, and I want to see it cast, you know, I want to see Janelle Monae's, you know, like I want to see it cast. I mean, they're, they're fierce too. These women are amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, this, this is a, you know, they're, and these technologists have been around defining our, our pillars of our society for a long time, mm-hmm. um, you know, so many things in our life that have been invented by black people, you know, and, but we don't have the movies that, that celebrate, you know, those, those things. And that, for me, that how, how, how black people and queer black people, especially now, like in my world, I see so many um, queer black technologists doing these amazing things with technology that can really just change the game, you know, to have a movie about, some of their efforts gets you very excited. It gets you very hopeful. It gets you very in the, we can hack this, you know, kind of mood. It's very inspiring. I would like to see more of those films. You know, matter of fact, a few weeks ago after the protests here in Atlanta and I had a round table with some academics and I asked them about the future of the, our next leaders in the civil rights movement. And one of the professors says, it, I think the tech world, they're gonna come out of the tech industry because they have, you know, they, they're on the, they're, they're at the intersection of all of this, particularly with the young people you've been talking about in technology. And she said, you know, I really think that the next wave of civil rights leaders are going to come out of the technology field. And from that, we took it and did a whole nother segment with. So uh, I think what you said was very powerful. Um, I want to get an opportunity for you all to talk about what you're doing and what you're up to. Uh, Sheree, let's start with you, Miss Cur- Curator. What you up to? <laughs> um. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a curator of a film festival in the age of COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm building, right there. Yeah. yeah, that's, you know, five different strategies for where we're going to be in January. It's, uh, it's at once really terrifying and really thrilling at the same time, because it's really pushing me to be doing something that, uh, um, you know, really be doing something that was already being called for uh a lot of what i've been speaking to in terms of you know thinking about the train in different ways uh redesigning the festival uh not that the festival hasn't always been on top of all of these devices at the same time you can go into any theater over the years you just everybody's on their cell phone and watching the movie but um there but the but the but we haven't been been mindfully designing the festival for that bio digital platform, so I've been thinking a lot of that. I also have a new post um at the academy museum i'm a, a guest curator there uh and they've given me a gallery to um work with to present uh a, you know how cinema the intersection of cinema technology inside of the, of that museum so that's that's been that's also been a very exciting. Um, okay. proposition, um, very energizing, uh, but that's, it's new. So I've been thinking a lot about that and talking to the curators, getting to know them. Uh, later I'll be um, meeting with Gary Dolphin, in fact. Oh, I'm really excited about that. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm up to these days, yeah. All right, Trevon, what you up to? Oh man, uh, I have a lot of really, really cool, interesting things that I wish I could tell you about. <laughs> You know how it goes, Anthony. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, I, I have I have a project at CBS All Access that is very, very, very much teetering on the verge of a green light in the next week or so. And I have a, a movie that I'm working on with a very, very big A-list actor that I can't wait to share with the world uh, in the coming weeks. And... Uh, I am currently writing uh, a short film that I think is uh, going to be really, really powerful, and I'm looking to submit to the Academy this year. So um, I'm just typing a lot these days, <laughs> doing a lot of typing. Nothing wrong with typing. Anthony, what you up to? 
we need you to keep typing, brother. Keep on typing. <laughs> yeah. Let's type together. Um, yeah. I'm ex I'm excited. Um, like Tavon, I have a lot of development going on. Um, two years ago, I launched my production company, Anthony Hemingway Productions, um, AHP, and it's been a beautiful kind of um, progression in terms of the slate of material that I've I've been able to acquire and 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 also create from within. Um, I just signed a deal at 20th. And so it's just been full, you know, this, this shutdown was a blessing to be able to kind of clear uh, a little space to really get in, in, in the think tank and, and put a lot of attention to the development that I'm, I'm working on. And at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to plan my comeback to the big screen um, and with the film. So I have several things that I'm working on on at, at, as well uh, on the film side. I'm actually, as soon as we hang up, I'm going to do a writer's retreat on one of my most exciting um, projects that's been a passion of mine that deals with toxic masculinity, Sherry, um, uh, that I'm excited about um, today. So yeah, it's that. I'm currently working on a series called Genius about Aretha Franklin. Uh, we got shut down um when the pandemic hit uh so we have about three episodes left to shoot whenever we get the go ahead to go back um and a couple pilots that are in the pipeline that'll be following that um as soon as i complete that so a blessing well one of the things that i do yeah that's a blessing for all of you um and i'm, I'm very excited and happy for y'all um despite none of y'all mentioned the uh, content about a public radio host, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that I always do on my show, because I, I, as a journalist, but I, I'm also a storyteller, and I always ask guests, you know, when they share their journeys or their stories, and I always ask them about the message that they want to leave for someone who might be listening, who is interested in the same area or the same space. So um, I'm going to ask you all the same thing, um, and, and I'll stay with, I'll start with you, Trevon. You know, sum up your journey, your journey so far, and what is that message to that that younger Trayvon out there that's listening? Oh man, um, for me, my journey has been, I think, a series of preparation, meeting, opportunity, and I've just constantly tried to stay prepared for anything that could come my way, and so I'm constantly behind the scenes learning new trades learning new new crafts learning new elements of storytelling learning things that have nothing to do with writing or storytelling that can just infuse you as a person and so i would say to anybody like especially wanting to get into this business wanting to tell stories uh, in any capacity is is to just understand that it, as cliche as it sounds like it's it's really about where you where you're going and not the destination it's the journey it's the work you're putting in that's getting to this thing you think you want because i've i've found i've hit multiple milestones in my career that i thought would feel a certain way and that they do for a day or two <laughs> and then you go back to realizing, oh, I got to keep writing. I got to keep working. I got to keep doing things. And if that's what you want to do. And so I, I would say to them, you know, uh, be persistent and, and, and know that you're not going to love it every day. And, but if, if your goal is to, to change the world or make an impact through storytelling, just, just write, just tell a story. And it doesn't matter who, who, you, who likes it or who doesn't like it, just keep telling stories because that's how we all get to where we got in terms of the writers I know and the people I know who, who finally one day nail down that one script or that one impactful thing that they do. And it's not gonna be, the, it may not be the first thing, it might be the first thing, but um, just keep doing it. And I, that's what I feel like it's gotten me where I am. Anthony? Um, to even echo what I agree with and believe in exactly what Javon said, you know, it's about, you know, when you do get the mic, what are you going to say and, and how do you use it? 
Um, I've always wanted to, you know, it's that old gospel song from the Clark sisters um, uh, that I grew up hearing um, uh, titled, Is My Living in Vain? And I, you know, I, from a kid, always wanted to, it had something to do with kind of that initial dream of wanting to create a legacy and, and something that brought purpose and meaning and affected um, uh, just my own life, but what could be, you know, a gift to others. And so it's just a matter of continuing to persevere and work hard and, and realize that, you know, the impossible is possible, you know, and, and not giving up, you know, because we all face it, you know, no matter where we get to, you know, you can sit and look at someone's life. You know, that's one of the things just to kind of dovetail out of that is, you know, that competition, there's something good about the competitive spirit that drives you and gives you that motivation and that, 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 that quest and, you know, that unstoppable spirit. Um, but there's something, the negative aspects of it that, that I hate to see infiltrate, you know, what we all are trying to do, you know, stop comparing yourself to someone else you know, know who you are, find your truth, tell your story, um, and, 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 and be confident and comfortable within yourself. Right. Shari, you get the last word. I mean, I can't echo what, what you two have said um, any louder, you know? I mean, it, it's, uh, you, you, we live in a system that uh, wants us to believe that we are, working alone, living alone, but you are not alone. We are here. We are here and we need you to do exactly what, what Trevon and Anthony just said, to work hard. Trust your instincts. They're yours. If you have that instinct, you are not alone. So many, your whole audience has a, a connection to the instinct that you are, are, are connecting to. And that's what we need to see on the screen. It's what we need to see on the screen. It's, it's how I push movies through Sundance by convincing my colleagues that I'm not alone. I'm connected to so many people who love this film and have been over the years because I'm old, have been proven right over and over and over again. So, 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 so stick with your instincts, keep writing, keep developing your craft and uh, our call is open, so so I'm here for you. So be there for me and submit to the Sundance Film Festival, okay? Because <laughs> I'm looking for your work. Uh, Cherie, Trayvon, Anthony, thank you so much. What a wonderful conversation. What yeah. a wonderful place to have this conversation, and I really enjoyed it. I'm thank you. Gonna go write, I'm gonna go write something. Yeah, thank you, Rose. <laughs> thank you, Rose. Thank That's you. Really thank you, Rose. Develop it. I'm ready. Thank you, Rose, and thank you. Uh, Creators, uh, Trevon, Shari, Anthony, you guys were terrific. This conversation was amazing. And so we appreciate you. Drinks are all on me the next time we meet. <laughs> okay. Let's do it. Awesome. Peace and light, everybody. Thank you. Right. Pleasure, Thank guys. You. Bye, Take guys. care.